common misperception among some Armenians and non-Armenians is that the Armenian diaspora dates back to the 20th century and to the um, to the genocide of the 20th century as well as the 1890s massacres. Of course, lost in this misperception is the fact that the Armenians had a vibrant and thriving, commercially successful, culturally um, impressive diaspora in the early modern period. That is to say, in the period between 1500 and 1800, uh, when Armenians dispersed in large numbers from their original homeland in the eastern fringes of Anatolia on the Armenian plateau and went on to populate eventually port cities across the Mediterranean as well as the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic seaboard. How did this diaspora of dispersion come about? It came about essentially in the period between 1596 and 1608, uh, give or take a few years, because of two unprecedented acts of violent displacement and dispossession. And these two acts happened in near simultaneity in the same geographic space that overlapped with the Armenian homeland. And these acts were, on the one hand, a series of uprisings in the eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire, known collectively as the Jalali uprisings, that begin, roughly speaking, in 1596 and carry on until the 16. 40s, which resulted in tens of thousands of Armenians fleeing the unstable region of the east to find refuge and safety in safer parts of the Ottoman Empire in the cities such as Istanbul, Izmir, and Rodosto. And there they went on to establish the Western Armenian diaspora. At the same time, in 1603-1604, of course, we have the Ottoman Safavid uh, empires, the two gunpowder empires bumping up against each other on the eastern frontier of the Ottomans and the northwestern frontier of the Safavids and waging war for several years. During this war, Shah Abbas I, the Safavid monarch, forcibly displaced up to 300,000 Armenians from the frontier zone, the same area where the Armenians had been fleeing the Jalalis, essentially. In the process, the Shah went on to create the Eastern Armenian Diaspora and the most well-known branch of that diaspora settled on the outskirts of his new imperial capital of Isfahan, where they've created a thriving commercial suburb known as New Julfa in memory of their evacuated town. Years later, both these communities, Istanbul, Izmir, Rodosto, and Isfahan, became places where Armenians began to migrate from in quest of commercial success, riches, and so on. So there was a trade diaspora that formed after this initial diaspora that was based on violent and forced migration. Because these forced migrations and followed uh, soon after by voluntary migrations of merchants, missionaries, and so forth, Armenians found themselves in the early modern period in a position of being ideal typical boundary crossers, people who crossed uh, frontiers and boundaries, whether cultural, uh, jurisdictional, or uh, legal, uh, or, or political. And so in the process of crossing boundaries, they soon realized that given their role in as uh, talented uh, speakers of multiple languages, Persian, Arabic, Turkish, Armenian, etc., and some of them, of course, new European languages, they were in an ideal place of uh, performing functions that usually are reserved for people who occupy liminal spaces in history. That is to say, people who are who live in the zones of ambiguity and uncertainty between cultures, between languages, and so forth. And so in that sense, the Armenians came to occupy this space because, of, because they supplied a need that was there between cultures that were suddenly being brought together in contact, but did not necessarily understand each other's norms or languages. And there, if we look at the British East India Company that came into the Indian Ocean in the early 1600s, one of the first things they did was to reach out to the Armenians who had already been colonizing that space before them. And in particular, in Bengal, what is today Calcutta, when the British received a farman or a permission from the Mughal authorities to establish a base in Calcutta, the person they appealed to to negotiate for them was an Armenian merchant who had already been living there for many years, a merchant by the name of Hoja Israel di Sarhat, a merchant of Julfan origin. He was an ideal liminal subject in the sense that he was both an Indian among Indians and a European among Europeans. And the fact that he spoke Persian fluently, the fact that he he knew the customs and mores of the place, that he was accepted as one as an insider by the Indians, and at the same time close enough to be an insider for the British, went a long way in helping him to negotiate this important treaty. 
When the French Compagnie des Indes Orientales arrived in the scene in the 1660s, the person they entrusted their negotiations to to accomplish a base in a place called Mazuli Patam was an Armenian merchant from Isfahan, again a Jofan Armenian, a man by the name of Makara Avashins, who was essentially almost like a director of the company, and he negotiated a treaty with the local Sultan of Golconda to get the French special privileges to establish a base in Mazuli Patam, which became one of the important hubs of French trade in India. The first cafes in Europe begin opening up in the 1650s, 1660s. The first cafe in Paris is 1672. The uh, the person who opened it is an Armenian from Aleppo by the name of Pascal, whose real name was Harutyun. Right? He was a go-between in the sense that he operated between Eastern culture, in this case Ottoman culture, which was what he was in some ways, what he represented, and Western culture. And uh, similarly, the first hammams in Europe were introduced by Armenians from the Ottoman Empire in this case, and also the first places where Europeans learned to dye Indian textiles, calico textiles. The textile workshops in Marseille and Livorno and Amsterdam, which were all the rave in Europe at this time, were opened by Armenians from Jofa or from the Ottoman Empire because they were able to bridge the East and the West. Because they embodied, they exemplified the traits, the cultural traits of both of these worlds. And they fuse them together and harmonize them in their own identity. And it's this liminal, liminality of, the, of these subjects that makes them, I think, fascinating to study and goes a long way in explaining why they survived as a community. So Armenians, as far back as antiquity, are known for being always in between, between in the ancient world, Greco-Roman and Parthian or Sasanian culture. Later on, it becomes between European and Middle Eastern Islamic, Islamicate culture. And making a living on the boundaries and thresholds of history has been a really important factor in enriching the Armenian experience and therefore also of, of helping Armenians survive and thrive uh, in ways they would have not, not done otherwise had they been, let's say, more inclusive and inward-looking.